Hey everyone, welcome back to the channel. Today we're going to be going through A Christmas Carol Stave 1. I'm probably going to have to break this video up into several parts because, as you probably know, Stave 1 is really, really long. <laughs> if you haven't already watched an audiobook version of this or read this recently, please go and reread it first. I will be explaining a few of the key kind of plot points as we go through, but mostly this video is a deep dive commentary, analyzing language, looking at a bit of structure, looking at context. All those important things to get you to the highest levels for your GCSEs, okay? So yeah, let's dive straight in. Stave 1, Marley's Ghost. And the first thing that is immediately important is that Dickens really starts the novel off in media res. In media res. So if you've never heard that term before, it's basically immediately kind of in the middle of the story. He doesn't say who Marley is. He doesn't sort of give any sense of anything that's going on other than Marley's dead. So immediately this forms a little bit of a hook or piques the reader's fascination of like, well, who is Marley? Why is he dead? Why should I care? Why is his ghost coming back later? Yeah. A little bit of context on that. At first, when Dickens actually like was publishing Christmas Carol, he did it in episodes. So he didn't initially put out the entire novel. He put out episodes in uh, newspapers actually and then uh, sort of gathered a lot of public interest and then turned it into one novel that obviously we know today. So it was really important that every time he put one of his episodes out or one of the pieces out that it had these interesting hooks and a bit of drama, things like that. I'd like to start off with that I think is important context is that Dickens himself was in a lot of trouble financially at this point. He really needed a successful story and in the Victorian era, and this was written in the 1830s, gothic gothic stories ghost stories were the most popular stories so he's deliberately trying to cater his story to being one of the most popular types of story at this point because he desperately needs some money so marley was dead to begin with straight away and also the structure of that we've got these short it's a short simple sentence which creates kind of a sense of tension and bluntness straight away as well and this is then a repeated this idea of him being dead is repeated multiple times so this is repetition of the same idea He's dead, he's dead, he's dead. Just trust me, he's dead is what Dickens is saying, okay? And the reason that he does this is because what Dickens is setting up is the fact that Marley's ghost is coming. So there is this sense of foreboding. Obviously, the stave is called Marley's ghost, right? And he relates it to Hamlet. He says, you know, if we were not perfectly convinced that Hamlet's father had died at the beginning of the play Hamlet, then there wouldn't have been anything remarkable about Hamlet taking a stroll at night but obviously it is remarkable because Hamlet Senior when he strolls through at night is dead so Hamlet Junior the main character is seeing a ghost and that's very important obviously to Hamlet we're not talking about Hamlet now but why he is comparing it to Hamlet is he's saying look if you don't understand that Marley is definitely dead he's been dead seven years he's dead as a doornail then when Marley comes later you're just going to be like oh it's another character so he wants to really impress and foreshadow the fact that Marley's ghost is coming back and this is going to be a big deal. The relationship between Scrooge and Marley is also really laid out. I'm just going to put one long quote, but just remember for your exams, you're not going to do this whole quote here in the middle. Soul was his sole ex executor, sole administrator, sole assigned, sole residu uh, residuary, legatee, sole friend, sole mourner. And even Scrooge was not so dreadfully cut up by this sad event, right? So this is actually a really important quote as well. If I were writing this in the exam, I'd literally just put Scrooge was his sole executor, dot, dot, dot. Even Scrooge was not dreadfully cut up by the sad event. I keep it 10, 15 words maximum in the exam. But the reason that this is important is because what it's basically saying is that Marley wasn't liked. He was, was you know, not missed, not liked. And this then forms a parallel with... I'm running out of space already. <laughs> parallel with Scrooge okay so the fact that Scrooge later on when it's talking about Scrooge potentially dying no one would miss him either pretty much so there's also this sense that you know he wasn't a nice man and he wasn't liked so we're not supposed to like him and yeah he just kind of lived this greedy life and then died I guess I'll say one more thing about that is that this is all linking to one of the major themes which is transformation okay and the fact that Scrooge is on something called a redemption arc. So redemption arc means that a character starts in a low position and through good choices and good, you know, advice and, you know, stepping into the light, so to speak, 
they become redeemed, they become better, yeah? And so Scrooge eventually is transformed and redeemed from this Marley-like character, not very nice guy, no one really would miss him if he's dead, harsh as that sounds. He's going to become a much better character, valuable, liked by people, actually helping the world, all that good stuff. Now, the reason that's important is because Dickens was desperately trying to um, transform the business owners and upper class members of society of his time in the 1800s. He really strongly disliked the treatment of the poor and the fact that the rich had so much power over the poor. Again, I'm going to go into that in more detail later, but I just want you to see that he's setting this up really clearly, that the business owners and the upper class and the rich are pretty much disliked in society. And when they die, no one even really misses them. Scrooge is such a person. He is very wealthy, not going to be missed. Um, Scrooge never paints out Marley's name off of their counting house, their shop. And this, I think, has a double meaning. It is partly just because Scrooge is really cheap. And so he just doesn't want to spend the money to have the sign repainted with just his name on it. But I think there is a deeper meaning, which is that as much as he doesn't want to admit or show any feelings or emotions, he does miss his friend. And to scrub out his name from their business sign is kind of a level of having to accept the death of his friend. And remember, Scrooge is a really lonely guy. He doesn't have many friends or much going on. So I think that that also is a deeper meaning to why he never uh, paints out Marley's name. Because the truth is about the money is like, technically he could do it himself, right? And it wouldn't cost very much. So the money thing to me seems more of an excuse, like, oh, I don't want to pay for a sign to be repainted. I think the deeper meaning is he, he does miss his friend deep down, at least on some level. Scrooge is described with a series of very negative verb choices. He's described as a squeezing, wrenching, grasping, scraping, clutching, covetous old sinner. And all of these verbs have to do with like grabbing onto things, like holding onto things. It's a symbol of greed, right? If you squeeze onto something, wrench onto something, grasp onto something, scrape something down, try and get everything out of it, clutch on to something. Yeah. So it's this idea that he is just desperately like frugal and cheap with every penny that he has, even though he has a lot of money. He's a very wealthy man, Scrooge. So th these are not good descriptions of him. Uh, they, these, they're very negative descriptions of him. But then we have a, a description which is a little bit more positive. He's described as being solitary as an oyster. So we've got this simile in here, solitary as an oyster. Um, and the reason that that is a really interesting image is that an oyster obviously has a hard shell. But if you prize it open, there's normally something valuable inside, like a pearl, right? So I think that this also is uh, Dickens trying to do a little bit of foreshadowing that Scrooge is going to be on this redemption arc and that maybe if we can prize open his hard shell, we can get to the pearl inside. And that is basically exactly what happens. Okay, at this point though, he is very unemotional. He isn't swayed by very much at all. No warmth could warm him, no wintry weather could chill him. He's very unaffected by the people around him, the circumstances in. He's just on a mission every day to make all the money and to spend none of the money. So mixed in with all these negatives, though, like I keep saying, are some positives. So then Dickens uses this interesting line, once upon a time, yeah? And obviously that links to fairy tales, right? And fairy tales usually have a happy ending. So I think that the once upon a time is meant to link to the idea that later there will be a happily ever after. And that also links to... I mentioned that the story is a gothic story. The other really popular genre of the Victorian era would have been Christmas stories. So it's both. It's gothic and it's Christmas. Christmas stories obviously are supposed to have happy endings, Christmas miracles, whatever, right? So do you see how we sort of blending the two? We start with death and the fact that a ghost is coming, but then we also have like these little happy intersperses in, in here. Scrooge is sat busy in his counting house. So it, as much as Dickens is suggesting that this is going to end up happily in the end, Scrooge right now is still obsessed with his money. He's literally in his counting house, counting his money, counting who owes him how much money from where, looking at how he can put all his debts out to people, all that, all that bad stuff. Not only is he counting all the money, he's also trying to keep an eye upon his clerks, which is Bob Cratchit. Bob is a very important character as well in this novel. He is not only counting his money, like I said, which is showing his greed, but he's also really obsessively watching Bob Cratchit and making sure Bob Cratchit is doing everything he wants him to. He doesn't treat Bob Cratchit well at the start of the novel at all. Bob Cratchit is sat in a 
freezing cold room. Remember, this is Victorian England, so you've got a very badly insulated building with no radiators, no central heating, nothing. Scrooge allows him a tiny little fire that looks like it's literally one piece of coal. So if you can imagine like having just one little lump of coal sat on your desk and it's like, let's say it's minus five, right? How much is that one tiny piece of coal going to heat you up? Not at all. And, and if that isn't bad enough, Scrooge also keeps the coal box in his own room. So the clerk, Bob Cratchit, can't even go and get another piece of coal or a few pieces of coal to make a modest little fire to try and warm his hands up, warm him, his body up a little bit in this freezing counting house, right? Now the coal is what we call a motif okay a motif is basically just an idea that is repeated multiple times throughout a text so in this case the coal i think is meant to link to a couple of things potentially one is in traditional kind of christmas christmas folklore christmas ideas if you've been bad santa will leave a lump of coal under the tree for you if you've been bad right and obviously scrooge has been very bad he deserves this lump of coal so that's one thing the other thing is that coal uh, has the ability, as much as it's just this like raw material, right, to be very useful, lit on fire, it can provide heat, it can provide fuel, like back then steam engines, things like that to go far and to, to travel, yeah. So I think that the, the coal is also meant to represent Scrooge, right? Right now, even though he has a whole scuttle box or coal box full of coal, he isn't sharing it. He hasn't isn't letting his his warmth and his light and his generosity out. Okay. And the reason I say all this, skipping all the way to stage five, when I get there, he allows Cratchit to have a whole coal box for himself. And he says, get a massive fire roaring. Let's like really warm this place up. Okay. So this is a motif basically for Scrooge. And at the moment, his lack of warmth, his lack of generosity, his lack of light. Okay. I'm going to write those things down for you. As you already know, if you've watched any of my videos, you can pause it, slow it down, speed it up, whatever you need for my videos. So at the moment, we've got no warmth, light, or usefulness even, really. He's not useful and, and generous at this point. Okay, already a lot of notes. This might end up being a part one, and then we'll go into a part two after this. As a matter of fact, I think that's what I'm going to do. Um, so let me just pause this for a second.